Brandon was born in a little town on the west coast. Um, we met in the middle in the, a big town called Dallas. After visiting his hometown of Weaverville, it won my heart and we decided that this was a place that we wanted to raise our children. My husband Jeremy and I now have two adult children, a teenage son, and we're current foster parents as well. Um, we're grateful to have this close-knit community. I've served in this office for over 10 years now. My finance and banking experience spans over 20 years. I hold a bachelor's degree in accounting with an emphasis in business administration. I am a credentialed California County Senior Executive through CSAC. CSAC stands for California State Association of Counties. The credential I hold through CSAC is a two-year program that has specific curriculum requirements designed for county officials and built on a foundation of leadership and policy competencies expected of effective county officials. The duties and responsibilities of the treasurer tax collector are established by laws, codes, and county ordinances. As an elected official, I have fiduciary responsibilities. My duties are to collect, protect, and invest the vital revenues of our county. As treasurer, I'm in charge of our capital reserves, which means balancing the needs with the guidelines of our policies, as well as the state codes. Safety, liquidity, and return within the, the cash flow restraints of our county and other depositors are my mandate. Additionally, I, have to serve as a, I, additionally, I serve as the depository, performing cash management functions for all funds belonging to the county schools and special districts within the county. As tax collector, I administer the billing, the collection and reporting functions of property tax revenues levy. I ensure proper internal controls to perform accounting and fiscal record keeping duties and the collection of taxes. We serve as a check and balance for the other departments. Trina County is dear to my heart. I care deeply about our community and those that live here. I believe the combination of my experience and education makes me the best person to represent our community. Thank you. And our final candidate introduction will be from Diane Richards. My name is Diane Richards, and I'm happy to see you here tonight and be with you. Um, I'm running for treasurer. I will tell you that my greatest achievement in my life is I'm a mother of six. And as such, I have been very active politically because I want to leave the world that I want, that we, our founders, gave us. Um, I'm a rancher. I have a timber track as well, and I'm a businesswoman. I've owned as many as five businesses um, at the same time in the Bay Area. I was a protege for World Security Fund, um, who developed uh, the, the founder of that developed branch banking long ago, um, and they uh, protected and uh, insured American corporations across the world. I worked as a lobbyist in the state capitol as well as um, internationally representing American corporations. I got involved politically here because of the fires. I saw that we could actually burn to the ground and I said we have to do something. I was very um, uh, politically active in getting candidates to run. Um, I helped Sheriff Haney and um, I was on his safety team. Um, I interpreted the law for him on that team. And I began to see, as we tried to get more people into place that would address the fire issue here, that there was something wrong in the elections office, so I brought up the Election Integrity Project and got everybody trained there. And then I started to do an, a citizen's audit here, because something seemed to be wrong with the money. Um, why do we have half as many deputies as when we used to have twice as many deputies and half as much money? Uh, before we could afford much more. So I tried doing the citizens audit. I found many things that were shocking to me, for instance, that we no longer own our courthouse and our detention center after the auditor had to um, give me her own code to give me the CAFR so I could see what was really going on, what was being reported to the federal government. And then I began to look at um, some of our expenditures, for instance, our credit cards, and they were shocking. And I asked to see the bank accounts, and the county council stopped me and said that I couldn't see them. That right there is a red flag. They should be transparent. We should be able to, anybody here should be able to go in and look at our, our books. So as such, it's led me to this position now as treasurer, tre 
to ask for your vote as treasurer so that I can actually get to the bottom of this and what's happening financially here. I want full transparency. We don't have an oversight committee here. We need to have one made up of, of professionals that see, can see each month what's going on with the investments and with the monies. Um, it, all our bank accounts should be posted so that we can all see it at all times. We have the internet now, we can do that. Um, I intend to bring in a forensic auditor from the Franchise Tax Board to actually work in the office. Thank you. Thank you to each of the candidates who stayed right up in their time. All of the candidates. We're going to go through the questions now, and uh, I'd like to thank Pat Frost and Fire Chief Steve Renton for going through the questions that they, as they were submitted. If there are any overlapping questions, then we will consolidate them, and that will shorten the number of questions we have. Also, uh, we're going to allow a one-minute closing argument at the end of the questioning this evening. And uh, so uh, with uh, nine candidates, that will leave us about an hour and 20 minutes for questions. I think that'll be enough. But uh, you have an opportunity to speak with each of the candidates afterwards as well if you have additional questions. Do you have a question? Yes, yeah, so I'll give you trying to make sure that we don't bore you with all the questions about one Thank you. This question first is going to be addressed to each of the candidates for assessor. And we're going to, again, go through the same order that is listed on the uh, order band. The question is, are you a certified appraiser? And if not, how do you plan to deal with, and unfortunately they crossed off the last word. Are you a certified appraiser? And we're going to ask uh, Forenza to please respond from her seat. Um, uh, not yet. I have taken the uh, course offered by the uh, college that the state recommends for the appraisal course. Uh, anyways, and uh, once I'm elected, I can then get my appraiser certificate. Thank you. I think that answers not only the first question, but the second question that was uh, slightly crossed off here. Uh, the second, uh, same question to the second candidate listed, and that would be Shanna White. Yes, I do hold my certified tax appraisal certificate. I've had it since 2011. There's a course that you take, and then there's a final exam that you have to pass to uh, get that exam for that certificate. Thank you. And Ms. Wright. Uh, no, I don't hold that um, assessor's certificate, is it called? That's actually a requirement of the Certif office. The question is, are you a certified appraiser? I'm not a certified appraiser. You do have a, a year, if you're the elected official, to obtain that. And given my extensive educational background, I have no uh, qualms about being becoming certified for that. The next question is addressed to the Board of Supervisors candidates. And that is, according to Angie Bickle, Trinity County Auditor, fiscal year 17-18 general fund department budget requests show a deficit of $12 million with budget expenditures of over $28 million and budgeted general fund revenue of $15.7 million. How is the Board of Supervisors covering that shortage? Okay, great. I'm not privy to all that information at this time, being someone in the audience. You can read the CAFR and you could the comprehensive annual financial report, or you could read the budget, but there's a lot of shuffling of money around that I'm not privy to, so I could not answer that unless I became a board member. Thank you. Keith Brooks. Yeah, that's a misrepresentation. There, there is no deficit in the general fund. We are running a balance at, at that time, and I'm not sure where their misunderstanding is. This is all, you can go online and, and look at our 
our draft budgets, you can come and look on our final accepted budgets, and you can look at the CAFRs all online under the auditor's office. The next question is addressed to the sheriff's candidates. And the question is, do you feel the county's board of supervisors is a detriment to this county currently? And why? How do you fix it? <laughs> and, uh... Ron, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really not in a position to uh, talk badly about anybody, and I don't believe I'm going to respond to that question. Thank you. Okay. Tim, would you like to read the question again? No, I've got it. Uh, the current Board of Supervisors, I think they do a very good job with the resources they, they currently have. Uh, the makeup is, uh, at times, I, I can tell you, because I go to a lot of the board meetings, uh, at times there are several of the board members that don't agree with each other. And that's great because when you have a political system where everybody's representing people around the county, you need to have some unique ideas. It's good to have differences when you can talk about it. As far as being a detriment to the Sheriff's Department, uh, in past years, I've seen that the relationship with the Sheriff's Department has been less than stellar. And I plan on rebuilding those bridges with the Board of Supervisors, individually and as a group, so that we can get more money into public safety and we can build a better relationships with each of our communities around the county. The next question is addressed to the Treasurer of Tax Collector. Do you have a degree that prepared you for the job of Treasurer Tax Collector? And that would be addressed to uh, Terry McBrayer. Um, I hold multiple degrees in addition to um, specific degrees in regards to um, uh, county government. And I've also enrolled in some specific courses, a fellowship program, and also a credential program for teaching so that I can give back. And I'm also teaching to um, other colleagues throughout the state, so I'm in a, a higher level where I'm actually teaching others as well. So yes, I do. And Ms. Richards, same question. Would you like me to read it again? Yeah. No, fine. Um, I do not have an accounting degree, however, that's not required for this position. Um, I do have a, I'm a math, I was a math major in college, we're on the President's Honor Roll, Dean's List, I'm very good in math, and that's why I've been able to go through the books and look at, look for patterns and what's going on there. So, um, I hope you'll have trust in my abilities. Thank you. question is address the Board of Supervisors candidates. What are your future, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. What are your future plans for economic development and job creation for Trinity County? One second, I have a follow up question. So that's the question. What are your future plans for economic development and job creation for Trinity County? That's right. Um, my um, stance is that I don't suggest businesses to people because that's not the government's position. Uh, the government gets out of the way of people. We have a lot of creative people in this county and they know best what to do for small businesses, large businesses, however they want to do it. I would like to start uh, reaping an income from our forest once again that's been mismanaged in my opinion and we no longer uh, have the money that we used to get for our schools and roads and deputies because we no longer log and we don't utilize our resources and that's one of the things I would like to start doing as a supervisor working with um, our sheriff if they're interested in coordination or with the uh, land managers themselves. The, <clears throat> I agree with Kay that the role of government is not to be in the building business. Uh, the role of government is to build infrastructure and so we have several projects that are, are in the works or have gone through. So, for example, the Buckhorn project that finished will help. Uh, we have working hard on getting the digital 299, which will bring high-speed, modern uh, fiber through the county. Uh, cell tower going in in Lewiston. Uh, 
these are things that will help businesses. But the biggest thing that we need to do as a county is put through our general plan. Right now, we don't have the ability, if, if a company came in today and said, I want to build a uh, 20,000 square foot building, we have no place in the county for that to happen. So moving through, getting a general plan, getting community plans, and getting new updated zoning ordinances is the, the largest step that we can do to move this county forward. Next question will be addressed to the sheriff's candidates. How is your working relationship with Department of Fish and Game and Forest Service law, I believe it's law enforcement operations? Uh, Ron. Uh, working uh, for the sheriff's office for the last 20 years on patrol. Um, uh, I've always worked with Fish and Game and CHP, Forest Service. Um, that just goes along with what we do in the Sheriff's Office. Uh, just today, you know, we had uh, we did a search warrant at, at seven uh, Fish and Game officers with us on that detail because there was some really gross, negligent. Uh, uh, water diversion and, and trash in the area, so we invited fishing games to come out and help us on uh, those. And we had the uh, the biologists also with us uh, to address those issues. Um, and that's you know part of what I do um, every day as a code enforcement officer is address these water issues. Next, uh, same question to. Uh, I don't currently have a working relationship with those two organizations, but previously when I was a commander here, I worked very closely with the Forest Service and with uh, Fish and Wildlife, as well as uh, other organizations like State Parks, uh, other parts of the state where I've been a commander. I've worked very closely in building relationships with those organizations because it's important to realize that one organization, such as the Sheriff's Department, cannot accomplish everything all by itself. You need to build relationships with other agencies. One thing that's important, especially with Forest Service, is the Forest Service needs to understand that they're here off the reservation, so to speak, at the uh, uh, approval of the Sheriff. Uh, the Forest Service has jurisdiction on the public lands, but when they get off on the state highways and county roads, they're there to enforce those laws only because the sheriff gives them that responsibility. It could be taken away at any time if you find out that they're uh, uh, treating the public badly. So. The next question will be addressed to the clerk recorder assessor candidates. And the question is, why are the Mountain Community Health Care bond liens still encumbering our property tax? Um, I don't know. I, I would like to have the opportunity office and find out why. Ms. White. So the MCHD uh, bond liens don't have any effect. The assessor's office don't have any control over those liens. I'm assuming they're talking about the special assessment that was put on taxes and that was um, voted in by the voters last year. And Ms. Wright. I don't have anything to add. goes into uh, the 
help that gets charged into our administration so we don't pay directly out to the employees but get billed back from other departments. We, uh, that number is low. It actually is uh, over $200,000 uh, that gets charged to the supervisors through all the funds and governmental things that, that, that they have to pay into. It is correct we have the $24,000. Uh, there is some other minor stuff, and one, one of the big things is frivolous lawsuits. So we have some kind of frivolous lawsuits against supervisors at this time, and that's cost us, um, I don't know right now, say 80000 probably going to cost us $200,000 to put those down. And Ms. Grace. Um, I can't speak directly to where the money goes. It gets a little hard to track because a lot of times there's not names there's, uh, associated with the money. There's not... Uh, it's, it's usually a number designation, so it gets a little hard to track. So if you wanted to track a, one employee and what they were making, or our county council law firm, what they were making, it's very difficult. So I couldn't say for sure where the money goes, but I have to say that if the people are pressed to where they need to sue our county government to have relief, then um, that's, um, that's what they need to do. Then that takes money from their pocket, their personal pocket, to pay for that. So I don't think that I would call that frivolous. If people need to do that to get uh, have a voice in the government, I think it's actually rather sad. Okay, the next question is going to be addressed to the tax collector candidates. You know, the question is, what formal education? Excuse me. What former education do you have to handle this? Position, and we're going to start with Ms. Richards. As I said, I actually did um, work with the man that founded the World Security Fund, which taught me a lot about banking. That's what I worked under him as an intern for a long time. I also worked for my grandfather, who was a self-made millionaire in the stock market. And these are some of the, the responsibilities for the tax collector, the treasurer, is investments. And I have found investments already that they haven't changed, the, the, for instance, the mutual, mutual funds that we have, the three mutual funds that we're invested in, since 1992. One of them is a French company. And, and I, I really don't understand why we're invested in a French company. Thank you. And this the question was, what's your formal education? What level? formal, I'm sorry, I can't make it out, but you can okay. answer it regarding both. What formal okay. and former education do you have to handle this position? So as you said, the formal, former education that you've had, as I stated, so I've had the, I have a bachelor's degree in addition to all the education that I've had through county government, in addition to all the training that I have, so I've had quite a bit of formal uh, and former education. But um, there are incorrect statements that she stated. Um, the, our investments change monthly and quarterly. Um, and those uh, mutual funds that she's stating, those also change change quarterly. So those are, and stocks are illegal for government funds, just for reference. Okay, the next question will be addressed to the clerk reporter assessor candidates. The first question will go to Ms. Wright, and that is, what is base year value? Base year value is what your property assessment uh, would start at. And Ms. White? Your base year value, your Prop 13 value, uh, is what the voters voted on in 1976. It's, a, it's the starting point of when there's a reassessable transaction for your property, say you uh, purchased property, you had construction that you, that you uh, completed, then it creates a base year value. So then that is the value of your property, and that can only be inflated uh, no more than 2%, but it's based on the CPI that's issued by the Board of Equalization every year. So the board issues an inflation factor that we apply to your base year value to have your inflated factors every year. Maximum 2% issued by the Board of Equalization, not um, created by the <coughs> Angel Assessor's Office. Thank you. Ms. Peace. I have nothing to add. Okay, the next question was uh, written by a very savvy person because they're getting away with three questions. <laughs> what do you identify, excuse me, to the sheriff's candidates, what do you identify as the top two problems for the county in general? Secondly, name the specific largest problem. And third, how do you improve the situation? And now we're going to reverse that and start with Mr. Saxon. 
You want this in a minute, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, top two problems is funding uh, to bring additional deputies into the county, get them on the payroll, and get uh, resident deputies out to the areas. Uh, and dealing with the uh, rising crime rate that comes from the fact that we don't have enough deputies out in each of the communities right now. Uh, the largest problem uh, is funding, uh, along with uh, getting our jail completed on time. The new jail has to be completed on time, increase the number of bed space that we have so that uh, we can keep some of these people that we do arrest in jail longer than just turning around and letting them out as it goes. Uh, improve, I think that has a lot to do with my background and my experience in getting grants and working with state and federal agencies to get money and also building partnerships with other department heads within the county to share our resources, pull our resources, and develop a better relationship with the Board of Supervisors and in each of the communities get the community members on board to back the Sheriff's Department when the Sheriff goes into the, a budget meeting, they need to have support so that the Board knows that all of you are serious. Mr. Hamilton. Can you, uh, you don't have to read it all, just the beginning of that. What do you identify as the top two problems in the county? Number one, number two, specifically what is the worst problem in the county? And number three, how do you improve the problem? Worst problem in the county? Well, I don't, uh, I don't think it's the sheriff's office that's the worst problem in the county. We have some issues in there, but uh, I believe that those would be easily fixed. Um, you know, marijuana is a kind of a top issue in, in our county, and along with that, it creates the problems of the, the homelessness. I mean, right here and now is it's the homelessness that the people are complaining about and the thefts from those. I'm just going to say it, term immigrants that come into our county and the people that are on drugs. I mean, the thefts are just out of control. Heroin is, you know, has taken the place of meth over the last few years. Um, so those, you know, to me, the thefts and, the, and the drug use are, I would say, the, huge, uh, the largest problems. I didn't get to a resolve for that. Next question will be addressed to the Board of Supervisors candidates. The first question is, excuse me, the question is, who created the Trinity County Public Facilities Corporation and what assets does it hold? We have another sharp person here writing questions. When did the citizens of Trinity County authorize the Board of Supervisors to borrow money from it? How is it being paid back? How much interest has been paid to buy back our own cordex? We might give you a little more time. Uh, Your timer is given two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Grove, would you like to uh, do those one at a time? No, that's okay. It's, um, this is something that uh, is part of the COP bond issue of 12 13 years ago uh, to pay for uh, the COP bonds. The, uh, the courthouse is people that you know, you know, you borrow money on your house. That doesn't mean the bank uh, that, that you've given away your house. It just means you put it up for collateral. Uh, so that's kind of a misunderstanding by somebody. Um, those bonds are now uh, we couldn't pay those bonds off or get new interest rate for a long time. I believe the interest rate was 8.5, which was outrageous. Uh, but now we are in the process with the treasurer is doing a good job leading this uh, to get these refinancing down to a normal rate. Uh, looks very likely that we won't have to put the courthouse up. And then in this uh, process, we haven't been able to build any reserve money because that was part of the bonds, is that we weren't allowed to build reserves. So once this gets refinanced, uh, hopefully this year, our interest rate should drop down. Uh, we're estimating the savings of about half a million dollars. And uh, then the courthouse will be off, and we'll be able to start reserves. That's great. Uh, 
I'm not sure who formed the corporation. I know that at the time our uh, county council and our uh, CAO were members of it. Uh, it was used to facilitate using the juvenile facility in the courthouse as collateral. But um, if you actually read the agreement, which is very, it's huge, uh, we do rent our courthouse. It says right in there that it's a rental agreement. Um, the money we pay, uh, in my opinion, uh, we should have never done it that way. In my opinion, it is illegal because a cop bond is a facility bond and you use the money to repair the facilities. We never did that. Uh, it was never used for repairing either of the facilities that were used for this collateral. It was used for general funding to pay off debt, especially for the hospital. Um, how they did it, I would like, I would like to know. Um, they just did it. They had several meetings, many of them were closed. It was basically announced this is what they were going to do. So um, how they legally did it, I'd love to know that too. There was a How much interest has been paid to buy back or own the courthouse? Uh, whoever wrote that, uh, drop me a note. I can uh, go find that number up. I, of course, don't keep those sort of numbers off the top of my head. Ms. Uh, according to the grand jury report that the grand jury did on it, the um, initial loan was for, uh, for about four and a half million dollars. The time by the time we pay it off, we'll be paying ten about ten million dollars. So. Yeah, I will add in, in this at the time, which of course none of us were involved in this, but that the county was on teetering on bankruptcy at the time, and this was a stopgap measure to try to. But how they did it, I don't know if it was legal or not. I don't know. That's the next question will be addressed to the sheriff's candidates. and we'll ask you to answer first. What is your view of private property protection by the sheriff? This is a two-part question. And as sheriff, would you attempt to use asset seizure as a way to increase funding for the department? I'm not quite sure what you mean by private property protections. Uh, you're talking about, if you're talking regular patrols uh, and, and doing things to uh, protect people's uh, homes and whatnot, uh, my plan on that is to increase neighborhood watch programs, um, provide more support for the uh, trainee sheriff's auxiliary uh, with vehicles and grant funded uh, items that can go into their 501c3. Um, asset forfeiture is a, is a touchy subject. I believe that the uh, the original goal of asset forfeiture was a good thing, and that was take these uh, these uh, fruits of the crime away from the criminals, the big guys, the big the, the big cartels and whatnot. And I think that's still true. I think we need that. The asset forfeiture funding in the county right now pays for a lot of things, pays for training, pays for equipment. Uh, currently, it's sitting at about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that money is sorely needed because it can't come in through other budgetary sources. Right. Mr. Uh, private property protection, um, I'm kind of with him, I'm not sure what that means, other, and I'm just going to go along with the, what he said. Um, we are uh, building up the sheriff's auxiliary, we're getting new members, uh, we're getting more cars, um, to more eyes and ears out there on the streets and in the neighborhoods watching for things. Um, asset forfeiture, no, there's... Uh, that's too unstable to use for funding to hire deputies. Um, I think in the future that asset forfeitures are going away. Um, we hear a lot of talk about it, so I don't think we want to count on asset forfeitures to fund deputies. As a rebuttal, I didn't say that I'd be using that money to hire deputies only for equipment and training. No, that was the question. Oh. Like an opportunity to rebut. <laughs> Just the last question, or last part of that question. Uh, Asset forfeiture to rebut. Yes, what else? Asset forfeiture to rebut. Asset forfeiture to rebut.
The next question will be addressed to the candidates for assessment and clerk.
uh, every other aspect of public safety, every other uh, department head within this county that operates together to work on public safety, to work on the betterment of life in Trinity County. The next question will be addressed to the clerk, recorder, assessor candidates. Ms. White, please start by answering how would a Prop 8, how would, how would a Prop 8 affect my annual tax payment is the question. Do you understand the question? So a Prop 8 is something that you as a taxpayer can apply for. If you purchase your property in the height of the market, so then your base year value is higher than what current market value is, you can um, request from our office an informal review. Therefore, we'll reassess your property, we'll look at it. If it's lower than what you're currently being assessed at, then we will enter in that lower assessed value. The property will be looked at annually, and it will raise up annually as the market inflates, but it will never be any higher than your inflated factor base year value, that base year value that I talked about earlier, and applying the factors issued by the Board of Equalization. Thank you. Ms. P, same question, would you like me to answer? Um, it's mostly, as Shauna said, it's kind of a temporary lowering of your taxes based on if you bought uh, your property uh, at a very high value in a peak, um, like a balloon, for instance. Uh, and it just uh, slightly raises year after year until you get to your base year value. That's right. They covered it great. Nothing to add. Thanks. Okay. This will be addressed to the treasurer tax collector candidates. Ms. Richards, investing of county funds is one of the major functions of the treasurer. Number one, what is your experience in investments of millions of dollars? And number two, what type of investments would you invest in? Any specific <clears throat> As I said, I had my experience with World Security Fund in which we looked at uh, corporations, whether we were going to insure them for expropriation, confiscation, when they went into business across the world. So we had to look at all their finances, their investments, and who was investing in them. So that, that is a big encompass a lot. Um, first of all, I would definitely, the mutual funds that we have, the, the French one isn't even rated, it's not even an American company, it's on the Paris Stock Exchange. I do not believe that we should be having $2 million invested since 1992 in a French company. I would change that to an American company, if at all, because it's a mutual fund. We're restricted on how much we can invest in mutual funds. In fact, I looked at one of their prospectus, and they're going to now increase their changing their, their manager, their financial manager, which is usually a real sign, and they're going to go even higher in deriv derivatives, which you want to stay away from. Thank you. Mr. Bragg. What are my experiences and what would I invest in? So my experiences are, um, on average, um, well, I've been in banking and uh, finance for over 20 years. And so um, for over 10 years now, I've been managing a $45 um, million dollar, um, pool. So to clarify one of the statements that she just made, the mutual funds that she's speaking of, they are a legal security. 53601 is the government code that dictates what I can and cannot invest in. And mutual funds, if those mutual funds consist of U.S. securities, then I can invest in those. Those are something that I inherited, so those are something that I am selling off because they are sensitive to the market, and so I'm selling those off. But those, when the market was really bad and we were at near in, um, near zero interest rate, those performed very well for the county. And so most people would say, well, I would actually get out of those, but they're sensitive to the interest rate. But um, the things I would invest in, so, so uh, Bonds, agencies, U.S. different U.S. securities. So those are some of the things that we would invest in. Enough to can we change it? Knock it down here until ten o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first question. This will go to the clerk 
recorder or assessor candidates, describe how you would enforce California election code, the California election code as it pertains to public observation. Just write. Well, there is a <coughs> code regarding um, observation, and I think the most important thing is that we understand that the California Constitution, the only thing secret about the election process is the ballot that you cast. So everything else should be um, available to the public to view and to observe. So I want to be sure that we allow for that participation. I feel it's really important that the public become more involved, that we um, use volunteers as much as possible, um, to ensure that we feel like as, as, a, as a nation that we are not being misled in any way or things aren't going on behind the scenes or behind closed curtains um, regarding our elections. So that's very important. We want to be sure to um, enforce that and allow that to happen. Ms. Peter. So uh, I have been a certified election, election integrity project observer for two election cycles. And something that I would definitely change that the, that the current office is doing is allowing close-up viewing of um, signature verification because um, it, this is, seems to be some confusion over this. Your signature and your address aren't actually private information. Uh, so that, that, uh, that information can be seen at any polling place and it's part of the um, election observer um, codes uh, to be able to physically see what is being um, put through and what's not being put through. Uh, so that's the biggest thing that I would change. So allow close-up observation instead of being set, sat back 15, 20 feet behind a rope or as the uh, elections office is currently having uh, election observers do, Five, through a window. So we just recently had a recall in our office, so to make it more, um, to make it may, maybe not easier for the observers to observe, but to make our elections run efficiently and without interruption, we did create a window where people could look through, observers, anybody, any one of you are more than welcome to come watch in any election process. Uh, there is a blind that goes up, there are individuals who like to try and record uh, what's going on in the office, which is not acceptable, so a blind will go up and be closed. Uh, what I'm trying to do is protect the confidentiality of your personal information. Your address, your driver's license number, your telephone number, that is not public information. You have to have a certain um, reason, authority, to get that information. So I'm just protecting the privacy of your information. Thank you. Rebuttal, please. All right. 30 seconds um, That's actually not accurate. Um, during the um, election process, the election officer is required to post the name and the address of, of every voter with strikethroughs. What that allows for is for people to reach out to people who haven't voted yet. So your address is not private information. It's publicly posted. It's required by election code. Ms. Peeney, do you wish for Next question will be addressed to the Board of Supervisors candidates. 2016 grand jury found that the Board of Supervisors violated the Brown Act on several occasions. What steps have been taken to ensure that the Board of Supervisors is conducting the county's business in public? And what is your view of grand jury findings? Ms. Gray. Um, as somebody that's been going for over seven years to Board of Supervisors meetings, um, there is a problem with our closed session. Uh, I do not believe that our Board of Supervisors can legally negotiate for the sale of property. Uh, and such. There's a lot of conversation that goes on there that needs to be done in the public. Uh, as far as reporting out, instead of saying direction given to staff, we're supposed to say direction given to staff and then say what it is. That never happens. Um, there's a lot of that kind of thing going on. Uh, the grand jury, they did a lot of hard work. Um, and it, I've never been on the grand jury, but I believe that every member has to vote on every item that comes out of that. So they believe that is all factual and that it's actually an issue and a problem. And um, as an observer and someone trying to observe uh, our government in action, I agree with them. Mr. Rose, <coughs> would you like me to read the question? No, I've got that question. Uh, the grand jury report was, um, was wrong. They uh, refused to listen to case law. They refused to listen 
to councils. Uh, the vast majority of the grand jury did a wonderful job. Uh, there was one particular person that was actually had to apologize to supervisors for his actions, and he was asked to be removed for his harassment and uh, misunderstanding of the law. Uh, we were uh, very uh, willing to give them uh, a class in, in uh, the Brown Act and, and how it operates. Uh, this has been done over different supervisors in, in office, and we followed the law to the T. And in fact, the grand jury tried to commit uh, a crime by trying to get us to tell us what was going on, which was an illegal activity, and they were told so, and they refused to accept that. So uh, we did write a rather scathing attack on the grand jury, attacks to the best word, you know, scathing rebuttal to the grand, grand jury. Uh, we operate in full honesty and openness, and um, Hopefully in the future we uh, can uh, get them the information that they need to do their job better. Next question will be addressed to the tax collector candidates. <coughs> Ms. McBriar, first, what procedures are in place to expedite tax collection and ensure timely receipt? Um, procedures that are in place um, to expedite tax. So we've implemented a few things. Um, basically, we're processing um, things <coughs> first in, first out. We have also um, we've implemented accepting uh, tax or credit cards, and we have information available online. Um, used to be it would take um, sometimes it would be when I first came into office weeks before payments would be posted. Um, now it's it's pretty much a day or two before you have that uh, the volume that we get in. So those are some of the things that we've done for expediting um, processing payments. Any questions? Can you read it again? Um, until recently, when I filed my candidate statement, the treasurer's office was o only open a couple hours a day. Once I filed my statement, and obviously they got wind of it, they opened up from 9 to 4. I will keep the office open 9 to 5. That's how you get payments. It is good that they went online, but if you're not on the internet, how can you even do that? So people need to be able to go in there. A lot of people like to pay with cash and what have you. So I would definitely keep the, it open. One of the things that have brought, been brought up to me, there's been a lot of things brought up to me, for instance, cash payments that were not credited to their account. But there are also, for instance, supplemental assessments were being sent out to people very, very late when they can't even um, actually get a, 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 an appeal it. They're not allowed to appeal it unless it's within 60 days of the appraisal or the reassessment. And the uh, treasurer's office is sending it much later, many months after that, so they cannot appeal it. So we need to look into that and see why they're not ex expediting this so they have that right to appeal. Can I rebut that? 30-second rebuttal. Okay. Um, so um, in regards to a cash statement that violates all cash handling procedures, there is no one that comes in our office that brings in a cash statement that leaves without a receipt. That's been a continual statement that's been made, and that is completely, completely false. That does not happen ever in regards to supplementals. Um, assessments and appeals, that takes place with the assessor's office, not the tax collector's office. And so there is a time frame that takes place that they have been um, really, you know, working, um, wor really uh, kicking butt as far as getting those taken, taken care of, but that's not our office. Uh, if you want the proof, I have the proof that that's not the case. Next question. Next question, <clears throat> and uh, as Pat Frost indicated to me, this is not three questions. This is a book. <laughs> so, I know it's not legal for an owner builder to live in a new construct home while under construction before final inspection. My neighbor has been living in his unfinished house for over seven years. In that amount of time, he has been cited for many code violations. Why is he allowed to continue to live in his uninspected house and is not being fined for code violations? So that's the first question. The second question is, this is for the sheriff's office, his house and property is an eyesore, which has made it impossible for neighbors to sell their properties. Who is not doing their job? What will you do to correct this? 
And I'd be happy to read that for you, uh, gentlemen, in parts, if, you, if you'd like me to do that, Mr. Hanover. The first question was, why is he allowed to continue to live in his uninspected house and is not being fined for code violations? Well, as far as being allowed, um, that's out of my jurisdiction. That is uh, the uh, building code inspectors. Um, that's typically what they deal with. I have cited that residence several times. Um, it, uh, I don't assess the fines. County Council does that. I submit my reports to County Council and uh, they proceed from there. Um, what was the next part of that? His house and property is an eyesore which has made it possible for neighbors to sell their properties. Who is not doing their job? What will you do to correct this? Well, they, uh, to correct it, I mean, it we're, he's in a current citation right now. Uh, it's up to county council to follow through with the fines uh, for that property. Um, if there's, uh, once this process is over and he's still there, I don't have a problem going back and signing him again. Um, but it's not me that carries out those fines. It's county council that, that takes uh, this follow up on that. Mr. Saxon, again, the first question is, we got the background, why is he allowed to continue to live in his uninspected house and is not being fined for code violations? Okay, for the first part, uh, that is the, uh, the building department that's responsible for that uh, as far as uh, somebody living in a, in a uh, structure that's not uh, up to code and not completed. Um, so as far as not under the sheriff's jurisdiction, I mean, it's under planning. However, I think complaints that come to the sheriff's department need to be uh, at least addressed with the building department by the sheriff or the under sheriff. Somebody going over there and say, "Hey, we're getting complaints on this. We really need to do something. What can we do together to work on that?" The second part is nuisance. Or, no. His house and property is an eyesore, which has made it possible for neighbors to sell their properties. Uh, and who's again, not, who's not doing their job? What will you do to correct this? Uh, I, can't, I can't speak to who's not doing their job. What I can tell you, though, is that uh, we have nuisance ordinances uh, in the county, and uh, one step at a time, we need to go for, forth with that and, uh, and cite them. But at some point in time, they keep collecting citation, 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 you know, nothing gets done. Uh, you know, again, that's, that's up to county council to, to work with the sheriff on that and, and figure out a, a way to make the, the community safer and not have that ice work. Can I add a little to that? Okay, um, so along with that, once they get cited and once the county council uh, starts the fine process, then um, these fines can be very expensive. And uh, if they don't pay these fines, then they put a lien on the property. And they do have a new process now where they're actually. Um, uh, taking these properties from the people that are not paying their fines. So we do have a new process in place that we're going to be using in the future. Uh, Mr. Saxon, you doing? That is correct. You don't get the jeans.
Trinity County, as well as those having to do with liens on land. In addition, the recorder issues marriage licenses, performs civil ceremonies, registers birth and death records, and files, files fictitious business name statements. Ms. White. Well, it sounds like we did a real good job on our web page. Uh, was put out there. So uh, the third recorder is uh, we record documents to put public on notice of any property exchanging hands or liens or of, of property. So it puts the public on notice. The uh, also is the office to file uh, death certificates, marriage licenses, birth certificates. It's also the office where you can receive your certified copy of those uh, vital records. Um, since we don't have a registrar of voters, the registrar of voters falls under the clerk's function of the office, therefore running elections. Voter um, registration, running elections, uh, filing uh, in initiatives. The assessor's office um, is also a function of those three offices. And we assess property values, whether personal or um, real property. We extend the role to the auditor controller's office, those values. Therefore, the auditor controller's office could then um, assign tax rate areas, uh, special assessments, and then that is extended to the tax collector. So then the county can um, collect taxes, and um, that's for general fund. We get, I think it's 31 cents on the dollar, um, is but goes to the general fund that funds the offices, discretionary funds that funds the offices like law enforcement, treasure tax collectors, clerk recorder, assessor's office. Thank you. Well, that brings me up to the next set of questions. I want to. Uh, note a few things. First of all, when I talked to Mr. Hereford today, again, he's running unopposed. Thank you. I couldn't make this comment uh, if he was running opposed, but he said if anyone had any questions for the district attorney or the public administrator, they could call him directly. I'd also like to uh, express thanks to the NTLIA who has made it possible for us to have this event tonight. They are sponsoring the event and have arranged for the use of the hall and the refreshments and in particular there are two people who have been digging in for this county for a long time and uh, you can never give them enough applause and that's Judy Fluger and Betty Jenner so once again <laughs> I do 
not see the National Guard coming into Trinity County to try and remove our weapons, and if they did, they're, they probably have a fight on their hands. <laughs> I, I won't say it right now what side I'll be on. I don't know until something like that happens, but again, as your elected sheriff, I'm standing with you folks. Mr. Hanover, would you like to read the first question again? Sure. <laughs> your elected sheriff. Then California passes a gun law. Citizens are not allowed to own guns. County sheriffs are ordered to collect all the citizens' guns. What do you do? Don't collect your guns. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen on my watch. Uh, I'm from this county. Uh, I'm old school. Uh, Second Amendment all the way. Uh, the uh, National Guard. Yeah, they're going to have to uh, take me down with you guys, so I'm standing, standing behind you guys, over with you guys. So, so that's your answer to the first and second question. Yeah. <laughs> Next question is addressed to the board supervisor's candidates. Mr. Groves, Trinity County Code requires that an individual be employed as county council except for limited circumstances. Why does the current Board of Supervisors violate that code and employ a law firm as county counsel for all legal matters? Well, I of course would say that we're not violating any laws. Um, the reason to have a law firm is for the, you get a lot more expertise for dollars than you do if you have an individual. Uh, lawyer, no, little lawyers, and the deference to it, maybe he knows everything. <laughs> but, uh, no, no lawyer can know everything, and so when you have a single um, counsel, you then that counsel has to go out and get expertise from a planning lawyer, uh, a, a, a child welfare lawyer, and so with the law firm we have basically six experts on availability to uh, answer those questions and do a better job than what we, that I had seen from my years in county government. Ms. Grace. Uh, in our county code, it shows the requirements for uh, county council. If you need to use a law firm, and also sites where you get uh, that authority from, they don't have, it's not law, it's an attorney general opinion. I have it with me if you want to see it. It states in the attorney general opinion that you can have a law firm under certain conditions and they have to be outside your county council specialty. It also has each individual case where you use outside counsel. So if you have one person who's your county council, each time you use somebody else, it has to be a special circumstance the Board of Supervisor has to show that it's a special circumstance and it's a separate contract. And I have that in the Attorney General opinion and it's basically citing case law if you would like to see that. Next question will be addressed to the Sheriff's candidates. Back to each of the next two questions will be. Mr. Hanover, what is your patrol experience in rural remote areas, which includes most of the Trinity? <laughs> oh, I know Trinity County very well, been raised here, uh, uh, I've patrolled all of it, uh, there's nothing really more to say, I've been, been there multiple times. Mr. Sachs. Uh, believe it or not, when I was working down in the Los Angeles area, there were some remote areas, uh, Calabasas Canyon, Mohawk Highway, uh, things of that nature, and I patrolled those. Uh, diligently uh, going after such things as speeding motorcycles, but only because they were killing themselves, and that was one of my job is to prevent fatalities. Uh, when I was here commander here in Weaverville for Trinity County, I was very good at uh, understanding deployments at various parts of the county, looking at our statistics, looking at community concerns on where people needed to go at certain times so that we had adequate coverage to protect the people. Um, so that's where, that's where my strength lies. Uh, from time to time, I, I did get out on patrol here, and I got on patrol uh, when I was in San Benito County as well uh, to go out there and uh, deal with them. That's some very remote areas as well. Um, so I do have experience getting out into the rural areas. Mr. Hanover, what is the current rate of enforcement action to calls slash incidents? 
you understand the question? Uh, give it to me again. I think I, think I do. Well, it's written as what is current rate of enforcement slash action to calls slash incidents. I think what's the current rate of enforcement calls to incidents to enforcement? Just, yeah, I, I'm not sure what the writer wants from that. Um, Whoever wrote that, if you want to uh, try and clarify it and send another note up, I'll try that one again. Good news, we're going to go three hours instead of four hours. <laughs> we're going to need a break then. <laughs> Okay. The next six questions are for the clerk. We'll write them up. So for the clerk candidates, explain your understanding of the Prop 39 bond measure requirements. Ms. White. So I think this question is referring to the uh, bond measure that was put on the ballot in, in November of 17. It was a bond measure put on the ballot for the Mountain Valley Joint Unified School District to um, fix mold issues in their schools. Uh, there's a lawsuit currently going on saying that I put that bond measure on the ballot incorrectly, which is not true, and well, that'll prevail in court here hopefully at the end of May. Um, and uh, it's holding up the Mountain Valley School District from, from fixing those issues. They're having to rent portable buildings to put their kids in and um, costing them lots and lots of money, also costing the county taxpayer dollars for these frivolous lawsuits. Thank you. Ms. Um, you said me Measure 39. Explain right? your understanding of the Prop 39 bond Prop 39. measure requirements. Um, well, Prop 39 changed our, um, our uh, voter requirements for uh, tax uh, measures. So instead of it being um, a very high amount of voters had to vote and uh, get that percentage <coughs> up to um, pass tax measures, they lowered that measure, but they also made it so you have to have those tax measures during regularly scheduled elections, where you're not the only thing on the ballot, so you're not a special election, for instance. That's right. <coughs> So, um, as Francis said, Prop 39 was actually passed by the California voters. Um, what it did was it changed the voting threshold requirement. It used to be 67% um, to, pa to pass um, school bond measures, and that lowered it to 55%. Um, and what that resulted in was you know, quite a bit more of, of bond passages. It also authorizes property taxes in excess of the 1% um, limit. Um, which you need to be aware of because they could, you know, that, that limit that's been placed on how much they can charge you per your assessed valuation. So if you're $300,000, they can charge you $3,000. But if you had a bond measure, that lifted that. So you can be charged more than that 1%. There's also some specific provisions around um, there needs to be a uh, only use for construction, rehabilitation, or equipping a facility. There's also a requirement that the governing body of the school district had a two-thirds vote, and it be included on the ballot of a statewide primary or general election, a regular scheduled local election, or statewide special election. Can I read that, please? Yes, 30 seconds. So um, there would have been a, it was a regular scheduled election. It's your new bill election for any special district and school district. What happened was is there was three vacancies in that school district, and only two people filed. Therefore, there's not that race on the ballot. That's why they're thinking that it was illegally, the bond measure was illegally placed on the ballot. Thank you. Nobody knows the question. Would anyone like to rebut? I would. I don't feel that Mrs. White really addressed what Prop 39 really is. She instead was defending a lawsuit, which is really kind of shocking to me, is that something that's going on um, in the court system would be aired this way. Um, so that's very concerning, and I think that shows kind of a pattern of behavior. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, a potential conflict of interest. The only thing I could see would be uh, there are laws, uh, revenue and taxation laws, that say that um, a, a appraiser cannot appraise or assess their own property. Therefore, we would have to defer that to another appraiser within the office. Ms. Beebe? Um, as Shanna said, that is the uh, one one of the legal uh, things that you can't do. Um, and I would say not having family members uh, under you in your office as well. Uh, because Trinity County does have a, um, I forget the word, but uh, it does, nepotism, thank you, uh, a nepotism uh, ordinance that pro prohibits that. Right. Um, that what potential conflicts of interest are there for an assessor and his or her staff? Okay. I would see a potential conflict of interest if, let's say, that I owned a construction company and I was then assessing the, that person's um, valuation. That would be a potential conflict of interest. And actually, the Board of Equalization found that one of the significant problems of the office is uh, they, they need to develop written procedures for the assessment of staff-owned property. So that would be another potential conflict of interest, where how are you handling people that are on your staff? And then also, um, you know, written procedures for conflicts of interest exist as well. Okay, I'm going to, again, each time I ask a third person, you might as well stand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how should a property assessment be handled when improvements were done by a construction company owned by you or a staff member? Well, I think that represents a potential conflict of interest, so I think there should be an outside party. Um, because if, if, if I have a company that has done the work, there could be a conflict, at least the appearance of impropriety, that maybe you're showing some kind of favoritism. So to eliminate that and avoid it, one of the things you might do is have um, someone outside of the staff that's also a certified appraiser um, give some recommendations. I know that at times in the, um, when you're appealing as well, you'll present, for example, um, comparables from a realtor or another appraiser to make a, um, you know, argument as to what the correct assessed value equation might be. So that might be an, uh, an option. Ms. Beeney, how should the property assessment be handled when improvements were done by a construction company owned by you or staff? Well, I don't own a construction company. Um, but um, most of that, I would agree most with, mostly with what Lisa said. Uh, you know, get, uh, get an outside opinion. Uh, so an independent, actually I would go with an independent opinion on those um, constructions. Uh, that way, everybody knows it's good. That's right. Pretty sure that question was, uh, was raised towards me because, as I said earlier, that we are the uh, successful owners of white construction and roofing. Uh, there are tables when when somebody builds something. Uh, for one, I do not assess the properties that my husband builds for. I'll put that out there. But there's also tables issued by the Board of Equalization that my appraisers follow, and it's based on the size of the house, the type of the house, the shape of the house, or any other structure. So as for going outside and hiring somebody else to come in, our tax dollars in our county are slim anyway. So I don't think it'd be, um, it'd be fiscally irresponsible for me to hire that out to someone else when I've got capable staff in office to handle that. Thank you. you might as well stand. <laughs> That's okay. How will you ensure that voters' ballots are safeguarded and do not go missing? Um, so we have locked cabinets that ballots are put in. We have locked doors that not uh, only the elections office staff has keys to. Uh, so ballots do not go missing. Uh, they're securely stored after an election. Um, so that's what we do to, to secure ballots. Thank you. Would you like to read it again? How will you instruct? How, how will you ensure that voters' ballots are safeguarded and do not go missing? So something. There's a few things that I think we need to do. Um, we need to uh, make it so that not so many people have keys to the offices that the uh, ballots are stored in. Um, this, this was a known problem during uh, several of our past elections, and complaints were made, but no um, remedy was uh, reached. Um, uh, something else I would also really, really love to um, support or to advocate for would be to have a 24-hour uh, closed-circuit uh, closed uh, television in the office where the election is held so that if anybody's in there messing with ballots, people can see 
and uh, something can be done about it immediately. That's right. Um, do you have a question one more time? How will you ensure that voters' ballots are safeguarded and do not go missing? Well, there's some specific <coughs> procedures around how ballots should be transported if you're not counting them up the polling places. It should be in secured um, locked bags um, brought to the central polling place. Um, there's also, I think, um, you could safeguard it further by relocating the, uh, the ballot storage area to the basement where they used to be located because there's a key access that's there. Rather than having uh, where they're located now, you have two adjoining offices that have access, as well as multiple um, courthouse members that have access to that room. So I think we need to have more safeguards in place. Um, I would agree with Ms. Pena as well. It'd be really cool if we could have a closed circuit TV that could monitor it, and then everyone would know. Nobody's coming and going, nobody's tampering with things. I mean, you might as well. What are you afraid of, right? Transparency is important. Can I just want to remain standing, please? Yeah. Candidates are asked to sign a code of fair campaign practices and agree to abide by certain ethical practices. Uh, if one uses defamation, libel, or slander to attack a candidate's personal or family life, what do you do? Well, there's an election code that we sign um, as candidates that requires that you immediately and publicly repudiate those kind of attacks on uh, your fellow candidates. So if one of my supporters would do something like that, let's say write a slanderous, um, libel, libelous letter or something like that, I would immediately and publicly say, I do not follow um, what they're saying and their actions are inappropriate. <coughs> what? Uh, fair Political Practices Commission does have a uh, fair uh, code of fair campaign practices that as a candidate it's optional to sign. I did sign it. Um, I am one that will take the high road. I'm going to tell you what I can do for you, not what my opponents cannot do. Um, so that's how I run my campaign. Thank you. Um, well, um, you know, let me just say that uh, I am not a <coughs> So people have the right to free speech. Uh, if they're say if they believe what they're saying, it's not libel, in my opinion. But if you're just doing it in order to attack someone, I will tell that person if I if I can get a hold of them, if I know them, hey, please stop that. That's not okay. Um, I'm personally not going to do it myself. I have no desire to get into a, to a brawl with another person. Okay. Nope. <laughs> Sheriff's candidates. <laughs> Mr. Hanover, what is your view on the Board of Supervisors adoption of the Sanctuary County of Sanctuary County for Trinity? And how will you direct your deputies on enforcement? So I wasn't aware that they actually adopted it. Um, I don't think that happened. Um, the sheriff went to the board meeting and requested that we not be a sanctuary county. And I think the board, I'm not sure exactly what the decision was, but there wasn't a decision made at that point. Um, so um, as far as I'm concerned, um, this shouldn't be a sanctuary county. Um, what was the last part of that? There's a what is your view on the Board of Supervisors adoption of Sanctuary County for Trinity and how will you direct your deputies on enforcement? Uh, enforcement, well, we're going to you know, follow the Constitution the best we can and there's ways around this sanctuary. Uh, uh, Orange County has uh, their uh, posting all release dates for all inmates for public view where uh, the feds can ha have access to that posting as well as just uh, citizens. So that is one way that we can get around from uh, so we're not breaking the law. Mr. Saxon. I'll read it again. What is your view on the Board of Supervisors' adoption of Sanctuary County for Trinity and how will you direct your deputies on enforcement? 
I was at that board meeting. Basically, the resolution that came forward to the board was to make Trinity County a non-sanctuary county. Yes. Yeah. That was the original resolution that was brought to the board, and that was voted down. So they did not vote to make Trinity County a sanctuary county. They voted, but they didn't vote to make it a non-sanctuary county. Senate um, Bill 54, another one of those wonderful laws that our Governor Brown signed into effect. That I guess this was right before he's going to take our guns away, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, it severely hampered law enforcement's ability to protect the people in our counties and in our cities by taking away the ability to work with the federal government to get rid of the bad people that we don't want here to begin with. Uh, I believe in, in uh, what the California State Service Sheriff's Association uh, viewpoint on that. They fought SB 54 as hard as they could. And uh, as Ron did mention, uh, and I mentioned several uh, meetings ago, is that uh, the Orange County Sheriff did it right and said, we're going to post all release dates. So that way, we're complying with California law, but we're still complying with federal law. And the sheriff is not an immigration police, has never been an immigration police, and will never be an immigration police, especially in Trinity County. But the same token goes, if, if somebody is arrested and incarcerated here, and they're going to get out of jail, and they're not a legal citizen, I believe in letting the appropriate authorities know that somebody is going to be released, and when they're going to be released. So if they want them, they can come get them. Thank you, one and all. citizens who are good enough to take the time and put the energy in to come up with good questions, to be here tonight, and to get out and vote. Really, so important. Thank you. <laughs> Mike, we can take some questions by hand. Sure. <coughs> um, yes. Are you talking? Okay. <laughs> For those of us who came in late, and can't identify all of the candidates, could they please stand up again and say who they are? Starting on our right. I'm Shannon White, I'm the uh, county clerk and assessor. I hope so. Terry McRae, tax collector. Rob Hanover, Sheriff Holt Sucks. Tim Saxon, candidate for Sheriff Corner. Diane Richards, running for treasurer, tax collector. I didn't hear your name, I'm sorry. Mix. If you'd like to ask individual questions, please come up. Thank you.